You are listening to the Fancy Free Podcast, where my guests and I tell our most embarrassing funny stories so that we all feel less alone in our imperfections and forge connection through vulnerability and humor. I'm Joanne Jarrett, and I'm your host. And you guys, I have Brianne Davis back for part two. I'm so excited to welcome Brianne again to the show. Hi, Brianne. How are you? Hi, long time no talk. Yay. I know. I, I know a lot more about you than the last time we talked because I've now read your book. Oh, no. <laughs> of course, I don't know what parts of it are facts and which parts are fiction, which was that's brilliant true. on your part. But for any listeners who are going to have to go back and catch up on you by listening to our first episode, just give them a quick synopsis of what your book's about and then tell us how it's been going since the launch. Well, my book is called Secret Life of a Hollywood Sex and Love Addict. It is based on my life. When I first wrote it, I wrote the first draft in 45 days and it was a memoir. But over rewrites, it just became this bigger, this different character, this she's me, Roxanne, but then she's not me. She's other people's stories and and dreams I had. So I changed the book to a novel, to a Roma Clef fiction Because it gave me the ability to put everything I've ever done, thought, all the horrible things you wouldn't tell a soul in the book. And then you don't know which one is real and which one is fake. And I can't get sued. Yes. Right? No one can sue me (laughs) because I've changed everybody's names and the locations. And so you can try to guess who they are in real life. There's Tattoo Girl glam girl, you know, cool girl, Mm -hmm. superstar, suits, all these people that are in Hollywood that I talk about because in Hollywood, especially sex and love addiction is rampant in the world right now. It's rampant, especially with social media. So I really wanted to write a book that entertains the reader and a normie, someone that doesn't have an addictive personality, but also educates you know, about sex and love addiction and not in a clinical academic way that most sex and love addict books do. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I just want to entertain and and also like put all my stuff out there and you never know which is mine or not. <laughs> yeah, I love it. It's kind of like my favorite form of exercise. You're doing something that's so much fun that you the exercise is just a happy byproduct of what you're doing. Well, my favorite way to get educated is to be entertained. And if you can entertain mm-hmm. me and the byproduct is that I'm becoming more educated and I'm becoming more aware of something in the world that I need to be aware of, wonderful. So yeah, entertaining is an understatement for what this book is. I practically devoured it. You created quite a bit of sleep deprivation. My family is like, (laughs) what the heck happened to her? What happened to you? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But I love that. I love books that you cannot put down or you want to know what happens next. Or when you put them down, you're thinking about the story. I got to get back to Roxanne and see what's happening with her. (laughs) (laughs) So what has been the response? How has it been going? Last time we chatted, you said you felt like you're practically crawling out of your skin waiting for the book to release, knowing that it was so revealing about Mm -hmm. you and things that you used to do a really good job of keeping secret. So how's it gone? It's been unbelievable. First of all, the first month, I it hit bestseller three times, which is crazy to someone that has ADHD and dyslexia and, you know, like all that. So that was overwhelming and the press has been unbelievable. But That stuff doesn't even matter. What has been the best is every day I wake up and so many people have reached out. I get a handful of DMs a day, sometimes Mm. up to 12 saying, wow, you just opened my eyes. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I thought I was always broken or just couldn't pick good relationships or went back to that unavailable person. And to have people reach out and say, you just helped me so much or Mm -hmm. you helped me understand my partner more. And the most beautiful one I have to tell you, and I'm going to cry, but my mom read the book and she called me on FaceTime and she was crying. Mm. And believe me, there's not very flattering things with Roxanne's mom always in the book, you know, and I can't say what's real and what's fake, but a lot of the past stuff she talks about, I'll be honest, it's my story. Mm -hmm. So when my mom called me, she was crying and she was like, wow, after a decade, which I've been in the, I have 11 years of recovery and sex and love addiction. She said, after 10 years, I finally understand what your addiction is. Wow. Like, I, she didn't get it before. And this is years and years of me talking about my recovery. Amazing. You know your book hits home when somebody who's yeah. so close to you 
gets a light bulb moment when they read it. Yeah. Uh, and then she said, do you want to know the, even the best part? And then she said, and some of the things you have done, I have done too. <gasps> wow. You're kidding. Yeah. No. And I couldn't even take it in, girl. Like oh. I was overwhelmed and I'm very sensitive as an addict, but I just like shut down a little bit. And I was like, mm. oh my God, thanks mom. And I got off the phone and my husband was behind me and he was looking at me and he was crying. Oh. And then I just sobbed like a baby. Oh. Like, it was like my internal little girl needed her mom mm-hmm. to say she was proud of her. It was such a beautiful moment. It was just like something and you broke loose and broke free, but it took a sec. Oh yeah, my like I gosh. couldn't let it when she was talking to me. Like the intimacy was too much Yeah, because like, yep. I'm in, afraid of intimacy and I'm like too much, too much. Mm-hmm. And then I just sobbed. Oh. But yeah, it's been – Beautiful. And then I just recorded the Audible, which was pure torture. You did? That's amazing. Well, I guess that makes perfect sense since it's your voice pretty much and you are an actor anyway. So, wow. Yes, I know. It it makes sense to you, but it didn't to me. I'm like, (laughs) what do you mean I need to record the Audible? The publisher and people are like, you need to do it. And I was like, but I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. I never imagined playing Roxanne. Like, I don't want to act this out. I live right. this. This is too so, close to home. Oh my God. Get a professional to do it. And they're like, nah, you're the girl. <laughs> they're like, you are a professional and you're free lady. Like <laughs> this is your job. So I recorded it for two and a half weeks and I kid you not, <sighs> I wanted to crawl out of my skin mm. the oh my entire gosh. time. If you could just imagine writing all your worst thoughts, your subtext, Mm-mm. things you've done. No. And then you have to say it out loud for and other people you, to in hear. In front of like sound people oh. and they're all listening. And then it goes, you know, it goes very sexual, as you know. It gets really it's graphic. very graphic because it has to be because you're trying to be truthful and honest and transparent mm-hmm. and real in this book. And so it goes there fast. Oh, oh, immediately. Mm -hmm. It's like a freight train, right? When you start reading it. Yeah. But that's what the addiction is like. I wanted people to experience what Roxanne and, you know, sex and love addicts experience, how their brains work, how the bottom falls out so fast. And one of the old timers in my program, which I always get nervous when someone in my program reads it, you know, just because they know the world and the lingo and everything. But it, the response has been amazing. And one of my really amazing fellows said, it's like a really long share at a meeting. And I was like, oh, that is the best thing I've ever heard. What a compliment. Yeah. I'm so happy for you. And I know I'm not your mom, but I'm like super inclined to like take the mom role with anyone who's younger than me. So I'm like, Please. I'm so proud of you. I'm so <laughs> proud of you. You did it. It's so hard. And you did it. And you're still doing it. And You have to wake up every day and and face it. But the fact that you're focused on helping people, you're not focused on bringing attention for the wrong reasons. You're focused on bringing attention so that you can help even one other person, like you said in our last interview, understand or have an epiphany. That's the only reason I did that. Your heart shows. I mean, it's very obvious to me that your heart's in the right place. And then it's so fun to listen to you on your podcast because it's just like more of the same. You're very consistent. And you told me in our last interview that your superpower was authenticity. And I realized that the listeners that haven't listened to your podcast might not understand why I said that's new for you. Totally. (laughs) I didn't mean it as an insult. And I know you know that. Dude. Because Brienne worked really hard at keeping a lot of things under wraps for a long time. Yeah. I love secrets. Yeah. The fact (laughs) that she can be authentic and be proud that that's actually now become a superpower is such a testament to personal growth. And personal growth is painful and hard. Oh. Oh, it's torture, pure torture. It was like the first eight years, it was peeling that onion. It was Mm. looking at the, you know, the griminess of your patterns and morals you thought you had that you actually went against and all the negative things you thought about yourself and Mm. all of that. You have to dig through all of that to get to what my therapist tells me is, you know, your real self. And that's what Roxanne goes through in this first year of her recovery is peeling back those layers and looking at the things we don't want to look at as humans. And like I said, I never wanted to write that book when I did the Audible. I never wanted Mm. to do the Audible. (laughs) But here's the beautiful thing. The Audible just hit number one two days ago. Yay! 
releases and it's like blowing my mind. But again, it's not about me. It yeah. doesn't even feel like I did it, to be truthfully honest. Wow. I was reading the book and I was like, oh, this is really good. <laughs> You're like, I wait, like, I wrote this. What? <laughs> you know, I go, I don't remember writing that. He's like, well, you wrote it. <laughs> he, has, he has to remind me. It's so funny. It's like you're having an out-of-body experience almost. Yeah, totally. I'm like, this is a good story. Like, was like, It was a total page turner, man. Oh, I'm so glad you read it. That yeah. makes me so happy. Oh, absolutely. It was so fun to read. I'm a voracious reader. I am too. I love reading. Yeah. It's like my favorite thing to do. If I'm in a good book and my son or husband comes to me, I'm like, um, excuse me, I'm busy. Do you just excuse me? me. Can't you see I'm doing something important? <laughs> <laughs> totally. Okay, so I don't remember now if I told you about Abby Jimenez's books. No. Oh my gosh. If you're a voracious reader, she is another person I've had on the show, and she's a cupcake wars champion. <gasps> I love Cupcake Wars. Oh, you're kidding. I love baking shows. Yeah. So Abby Jimenez has Nadia Cakes is her is the name of her bakery. She has one in LA and now she moved to Minnesota and has one there. Well, she wrote three fictions and you're going to love them, Brianne. You have to read them. The first one is called oh God, The Friend yes. Zone. And the second one mm-hmm. is The Happy Ever After Playlist. And the third one is Life's Too Short. It just came out. They're so good. Your style Mm. reminds me of her style because she's very upfront. She's very clever and funny and her characters don't take themselves too seriously and you you really have fun with it. And there's so much like modernity in these, like they're, they're very Mm -hmm. present day and it's really, really fun. Oh, I have to read them. Yay. I love new authors. Super, super fun. Especially female authors. Oh oh my gosh. totally a fan. Yeah. The other reason she reminds me of you is because she doesn't have formal training in writing. She is Mm -hmm. a baker. (laughs) You know, she's actually multi-talented. And I think that's what so many of us have in our toolbox that we don't even know we have is it's like, you can do hard things. You can do new things. You can do different things. You don't have to have a formal education at all. If you have this urge to like, you think you have a story to tell, but you think, well, I don't have a right to tell the story because I'm not a professional storyteller. Hogwash, do it. You know what I mean? Do it. Yes, that's what I did. I mean, yep. like I said, I didn't want to. And my husband was like, no, you need to take this writing class. And I'm like, leave me alone. I love that. And we went into that story on your last show. Mm-hmm. And But the thing is, I thought as a writer, you had to be able to edit and do everything. I didn't mm-hmm. know you actually hire a copy editor, have a publisher, have an editor walk you through what you're missing. And I Mm -hmm. always thought I had to do everything alone. And that is not true. You are allowed to have help. Yes, Every writer has help, but nobody talks about that help. Right. You're so right. There's always a supporting crew. Yeah. When I came up with my idea for loungewear and I'm like, I'm a family physician. I have no business designing loungewear. And then I'm like, wait, I can learn certain aspects and then I can bring people on board to help me with the stuff that yeah, I don't have time to learn. You wear loungewear. Yeah. Why can't you design loungewear if you wear it? Exactly. <laughs> and it was like, wait a minute, I, I actually think I can do this. I, yeah, okay, I need a cast of supporting characters, but it doesn't mean that I can't do it. Everybody has a, a cast of supporting characters, even, even the pros, you know, like even if somebody did get a degree in fiction writing and you know they still they still have to have an editor they still have to have a publicist they they're not going to do it all alone no so. you have everything copy editor and then someone at the very very end going over everything i didn't know any of that so that made me take away this pressure to be perfect or have it all figured out and yeah. i think if we just go into everything like that like i'm just going to do it there's mm-hmm. this freedom in that absolutely You know, what's the worst that can happen? I come up against roadblocks. Well, I'll still have more out in the world than I did if I didn't try. Exactly. Yeah. And you never know what doors are going to be open for you. You just never know. It's so wild. I'm sure that there are directions that you're now considering that never even were on your radar before you wrote the book. No, I'm on book number two right now. (laughs) That's so crazy. (laughs) You're like, turns out it's a series. <laughs> yeah, there's a third and a fourth book. So incredible. People are interested in it for a TV show. So my husband and I just wrote the pilot. Exciting. Yeah, and people are like, are you going to play Roxanne? And I was like, again, hell no. <laughs> you're like, you, you're you, killing me. <laughs> I don't have to do everything, do I? <laughs> 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 yeah, and I never thought that was possible. And I'm speaking more and people are paying me to come speak. So it's just like these things I never even thought that I would want to do. But being of service, when I do it in a way where it, it's not about me, it's not about ego, it's about helping another 
person that is suffering. Yeah, I love it. Okay, I'm going to ask you a couple of unexpected rapid fire questions. You just tell me pass if you don't like them. Okay. Do you have a recurring dream? Yes, I talk about it in the book. I talk about this recurring dream, especially in my first part of recovery, that I would have these children of the corn people chasing after me through corn mazes. It was terrifying. Absolutely terrifying dream. (laughs) That's awful. Do you still have it? No, I don't. After I went through the pain and the withdrawal, and got on the other side. The dream left. And this was years and years and years of this dream. Wow. It was crazy. Wow. Yeah. It was like my psyche was trying to work something out. And my therapist loves to analyze dreams. And- I think it's so fascinating. You just remind me of one that I don't think I've talked about. Ooh. In my Facebook group right now, we just are talking about recurring dreams. And so many people have the dream that their teeth are, are falling out. And I've never had that dream. Oh, yeah. It's a real common one. I have. Have you? Mm-hmm. The one that I had that's gone now. I have a lot that I still have, but one awful recurring dream I used to have all the time that I haven't had since I met my husband is that I'll all of a sudden find myself at the altar getting married. And I'm like, wait, what? Wait, I, huh? I'm, how did I get here? I don't want to marry this guy. (laughs) And it was like a marital anxiety dream. And I had it all the time. I was a serial monogamous dater. You know, I always had a boyfriend Mm -hmm. for a year or two and then I'd switch and have another one. So they always got pretty serious. Me too, girl. Yeah. (laughs) You know, I should have known at the time that it meant like maybe this relationship's wrong. Maybe we should move on. And then it took me a long time to realize ever since I met my husband, I've never had it again. We've been together over 25 years now. So I don't think that dream's coming back. (laughs) So, I mean, I know that a lot of dreams are random, but there are so many things that I think are seriously meaningful. I think dreams are fascinating little window into our psyche like your therapist thinks. Yeah. Yeah. They actually represent a part of you, every mm-hmm. part of your dream. And if, so if you have a friend in your dream that's flighty or flaky, mm. that it, that represents a part of you in your psyche that's trying to work out. Oh, how it's interesting. It's really fascinating. I love analyzing dreams. She's been doing it for like eight years, so I'm so used to it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so you're like, I got another crazy doozy for you. Here you go. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> so them up. Let's see. What is your best feature? I think now my best feature is my authenticity and willing to show all the ugliness of myself. And if I picked a physical feature on me, I love my lips. Okay. I've always just been been like, you have nice lips, you know? (laughs) Nice. You know, it's funny. Nobody picks that question. Actually, I don't think anyone's ever chosen that question. Listeners, I have about 20 rapid fire questions that I ask people to choose five out of. There are some that almost everyone chooses. There are some that have never been chosen. That's one of them. I love it. Well, thank you. Yeah, probably because most people don't think they have a best feature, but everyone does. I challenge all of you to sit down and think about what is your best feature. And if you don't know, ask somebody who loves you. They'll tell you. Oh, you know, and another one I love that I'm not judgmental. Somebody can tell me anything and I will not judge because I've either done it, heard about it. I've been there. So I don't, I don't judge when people tell me. Yeah. I think that's one of the reasons why your podcast really works. Oh, thanks. You don't just try to not be judgmental. It's real. That really shines through when you talk to people. Thank you. Do you have a commercial jingle that gets stuck in your head? Oh my God. It's like a muffler one. I can (laughs) sing it. Of course, now I can't do it. I'll probably think of it after we're off. But yeah, Uh it's this jingle from this local muffler place that I get stuck in my head. It's terrible. Yeah. A lot of times they're the bad ones too. It's like, how did somebody decide, yes, this is it. This is going to be our jingle. We're going to be known for this. noxious. Yes, totally. (laughs) The one I always get is, do you remember the Toys R Us theme song? I don't want to grow up. I'm a Toys R Us kid. Yeah. And (laughs) here's the reason why I sing it. My brain is just like a broken record. When my alarm clock goes off, I think to Mm -hmm. myself, I don't want to get up. And then it starts. I don't want to get up. I'm like, oh, not again. (laughs) (laughs) So crazy. (laughs) <laughs> okay. Well, Brian, as you know, the point of this podcast mm-hmm. is to share our not so fancy moments so that we can both remind the listeners they're not alone and give the example of how connection is made through sharing these stories in a vulnerable and humorous way. And we talked last time about your 
death of your character on the six TV show and finding out mm-hmm. that you're a sex and love addict, but there's one that we didn't touch on. And that was when your son was in the NICU. Yeah. I mean, that whole experience was, it's so funny when I talk about it and my husband talk about it. We were in the same situation having totally two different experiences. Yes. <laughs> so I'm, you know, getting the C-section cut open, laying there all drugged up, mm. listening to the playlist I made so I could hear the songs I love while my baby's getting born and they bring him out davis hold him up so i can see him he's all purple and squirmy and whatever <laughs> smushed up yeah pretty much and my in th- j- gross look you know mm-hmm. baby's coming out of it not the most attractive and my husband's sitting next to me and i'm just looking at him lovingly after they start stitching me up and he's looking over in the corner where davis was taken And he said he could see them starting to freak out. And I had a white sheet, you know, the white sheet that covers. So I can't see anything. The drape. You can't see past it. I can only see my husband's face. And he then looks at me smiling. I'm sitting there like singing loudly, like totally (laughs) out of it. And my husband said his legs were shaking so bad. It was all going to his legs because he didn't want to tell. He saw them like pumping his chest. (gasps) Oh my gosh. He gets really emotional. He actually can't talk about it that much. And then he saw them reach for the red phone and they picked it up. And, and then the nurse holding the phone looked at the other nurses and was like shaking her head. Like, no, they're not answering. Mm. And the panic on the nurse's face, my husband, Mark stopped breathing and was Mm. like, and they rushed him out of the room And, uh, you know, I still didn't know what was going on. And finally, they said he was in the NICU. His lungs were not developed completely. (sighs) And I actually didn't hold my son until he was nine days old. This is the first time I actually held him. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I didn't get to put him on my chest. We didn't have any of that. Mm. You know, I didn't breastfeed till the 11th day. So he was in there for two weeks. And I have to tell you... It is a powerless moment. It is very powerless. But here's the beautiful thing. He was supposed to probably be in there two months because what he had takes a while, but he's a fighter, man. He was on that ventilator that they put COVID patients on. Every vein in his body has IVs in it. He had it through his belly button. He had it everywhere. And my son is a fighter. He ripped out his own oxygen tube, oh. he ripped out his feeding <laughs> tube. He was like, I'm done. And he healed so fast. Aww. And he's doing amazing now. Wow. Yeah. That must have been so terrifying for your husband. And of course, for you when you realized it. But before you realized it, the feeling of terror and then the responsibility to try not to let you feel that in the moment must have been such yeah. a, just a tug of war. It's like, when there's turbulence in an airplane, I look right into the eyes of the flight attendants because I feel like I could tell whether they're really scared or not, even though it's their job not to show fear. And your husband was having to play that role. Oh, yeah. It was hard for him. In such a tender moment for him as a dad and for him as a husband. Oh, my gosh. And he's a fixer, you know, he's like that guy. Well, he's not allowed to fix my issues, but he loves to fix (laughs) things. He's a fixer, you know, Mm. he's He's that rock you need. And he really took on the stress. I was healing, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, we were in the hospital for four days. And then he went back, you know, with the breast milk most of the time because I couldn't. I was still really in a lot of pain. So he took on a lot of responsibility. And I think he has a bit of PTSD still, like when he talks about it. Yeah, for sure. You can physically see him Mm. relive those moments. Yeah, I think that one of the things that people don't realize about doctors is that almost every doctor has PTSD too. Oh, yeah. Because those kinds of – I mean, of course, it's different when you're experiencing it when it's your wife and it's your child. But those kind of traumatic experiences are so prevalent. You know, it's like sex and love addiction. It's I think it's a lot more prevalent than people know. It takes a lot more forms than people know. And a lot of people just don't acknowledge it because they think, oh, yeah, this is just something I have a hard time with. But it's like, wait, no, really look at that. He was traumatized. No, you can get PTSD from relationships. Yes. And I talk about that in the book. Your body stores that inside. Mm-hmm. We're probably all handling some PTSD from this pandemic. They said that there's going to be a huge mental breakdown mm. that we have not dealt with as a human race. 
Wow. This hasn't happened in hundreds of years. Yeah. And we are going to be dealing with some very mental health issues coming up because for the last year, we're all just trying to keep our shit together. Uh-huh. You know what yeah. I mean? Like put one foot in front of the other. Well, pretty soon things are going to start crumbling a little bit and we're going to have to start dealing yeah, with the that's fallout. What they said. There's going to yeah. be Oof. a lot of physical ailments. There's going to be a lot of mental health issues, depression, suicidal thoughts mm. coming up for humanity, yeah. they're thinking. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about it that way, but I'm sure you're right. Brace yourself. It's time to talk about what you've been loving lately that you think the listeners might love too. You said it was the Calm Meditation app. Tell me about that. Oh, oh my God. It's so good. And they added a new meditation group Oh, where it's relationships with others. Huh. So there's like 10 that, you know, broken empathy, closure with someone, envy with someone, that part of that calm app has really helped me because oh. I'm addicted to people. Yeah. You know, as a sex and love addict, we use people like alcoholics use a bottle of alcohol or her- heroin addict uses heroin. Mm-hmm. So when they put that one on there, it's the orange one. If you want to go on, it's like the orange square. It says relationships to others. It's awesome. awesome oh, awesome how fascinating. App. All right. I'm going to have to check mm-hmm. that out and I'll link to it in the show notes. Do you have a funny or awful or crazy date story? Your whole book is probably. (laughs) I know. I'm like, just read my book. book. (laughs) (laughs) Right? We could put a little like (laughs) asterisk. Refer to book. Uh No, but I think um, a funny dating story was, you know, my husband and I, our first date, I asked him out. Whoa. I asked him out and said, you know, like, will you go on a date with me? And he was like, yes. (laughs) but it was really cute he thought I joked so much during the date and I never got serious but I was just nervous so we have this like funny moment when we were together so you are you you put on your clown shoes and your clown wig Mm -hmm. because you were trying to make the the situation light and it made him think this isn't someone I could have a relationship with because she won't get serious. Yeah, she's not that serious. Oh, yeah. how interesting. Yeah, exactly. Huh. But it worked out anyway. <laughs> yeah. Aww. And then I asked him out this second time too because he didn't ask me out again. You're so brave. <laughs> so You're like, I no, I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty sure we should do this. <laughs> Let me just make it happen. <laughs> he was trying to play the cool guy, being like, Oh, I had fun. And that's it. I was like, that's it? Mm-hmm. You're just going to say you had fun? Like, don't you go out again? Do you want to do it again or no? <laughs> like, come on now. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. What's one surprising thing about you, nobody that would be able to tell just by looking? Well, first of all, that I'm a sex and love addict. Everybody's like, what? You know. So that's a funny thing. And I think the other thing is I love romance novels, but not like the good ones. I'm talking like the cheesy ones <laughs> at the ones. drug store. <laughs> the ones your grandma used to read? Exactly. You tear off the covers so nobody sees yes. what you're reading because you're embarrassed. <laughs> I love those. <laughs> well, when I was in medical school and residency, we did a lot of time at the VA and the VA wasn't quite as busy as the other hospitals, but we still had to be there mm-hmm. and you had to be kind of awake and aware and whatever. So they had this little rolling library cart and I used to go find the library cart and find like the cheesiest like beach brain yeah. candy novel I could find. And you're, you're right. The covers are awful. <laughs> awful. They're the most embarrassing. People look at you and they're like, what are you reading? I'm like hiding and in the call like room reading this book. Or something. Uh, yeah, totally. yeah. <laughs> I, I took one on an airplane one time and I remember like trying to hide the cover and the guy next to me was like kind of looking over my shoulder trying to figure out what I was reading. Oh and I kept like closing the book more and more because I was so embarrassed. You're like, get out of here. Mind your own business. Who cares what I'm reading? Right? Be your own <laughs> self. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Oh, this was so much fun. I could talk to you all day long. Thank you again so much for spending the time with me today. Yeah, it was so fun. And I'm so glad that we got to hang again. It's so fun. Well, tell my (laughs) listeners all the places where they can find you. You can go to Secret Life Novel dot com and you can get you know where all the audible is it's all over the world we were exclusively on amazon for the book but it's going worldwide now so it's at barnes and noble it's everywhere it's called secret life of a hollywood sex and love addict you can come join me on instagram at the brianne davis if you have a question for me or you know 
a personal question or just wanting information, DM me. I try to respond to all my DMs. Aww. Or you can go to TikTok at the dot Brianne Davis. Awesome. Okay. Good luck with everything. I'm so excited for you. Oh, thank you. And join me on my podcast, Secret Life, if you want more crazy stories of people's addictions and mental health and all that stuff. Thank you so much for listening to the Fancy Free Podcast today. Remember to follow the podcast wherever you're listening so that new episodes pop into your feed each week. And if you want more connection, laughter, and sharing, join the Fancy Free Facebook group. I would love it if you'd follow the Fancy Free Podcast on Instagram. And also, if you would tell a girlfriend about the show, I would love that. We'd love to increase our listenership. Have a great week. And remember, no one is as fancy as they look.